Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 591 of the podcast. And it is Sunday, the 5th of December 2021, as I record this from Auckland in New Zealand, where we are finally out of quarantine and isolation. You wouldn't believe how excited I was to be able to get out and walk for as long as I like outside uh, along the waterfront. So I am in a much better mood this week. (laughs) It's been basically two weeks of a process to get into the country and uh, now we are here and uh, my husband is reconciled with his mum after two years so it's all very emotional. Anyway, in today's show I'm talking to Michael Brent Collings about writing hooks and improving your fiction book description. Some excellent tough love in this interview from Michael Brent. You'll hear my reluctance as I find descriptions really hard and I, let's face it, I kind of resent them. Why do I have to sell myself in this way when I've done the hard work of writing the book? <laughs> but Michael Brent explains it in a way that makes sense. So I hope it resonates with you. And Michael Brent is also now helping authors with book descriptions. And uh, after, in fact, after we recorded this interview, I did engage Michael Brent to help me with some book descriptions including Tomb of Relics, which I'm going to read to you after the interview. So once the interview's done, I will share the old version and the new version so you can hear the difference. So this episode is primarily around fiction book descriptions, but if you write non-fiction, you might find it useful in terms of the attitude around these essential marketing activities. And we also talk about how things have changed since Michael Brent was on the show in episode 503, talking about rebooting your author career and uh, what has changed, I guess, since the 18 months since he was last on the show, it kind of coincides with the pandemic. (laughs) So that is coming up in the interview section. So no particular publishing news today. So I'll just a little personal update. Obviously, I said I'm super excited to be out of uh, the restrictions that we've been under. But the city and the country, in fact, is still sort of uh, has quite a lot of restrictions. So it's great to be here because uh, yeah, Jonathan's mum has uh, cancer. So uh, obviously, it's been a worry. I know many of you are going through similar issues with not being able to see family and Yeah, I was also planning on running some events while I'm in New Zealand, but that is not going to happen anymore because, uh, firstly, because of the restrictions. I don't think people want to spend a whole day in a room with other people (laughs) right now. (laughs) <laughs> but also because Jonathan's mum is immunocompromised, uh, we are just going to basically not do much at all <laughs> except be with her and uh, family time and a lot of walking outside, which we can all do. So strange times indeed, as as ever. It is, uh, yeah, uh, just when we thought it was all over, here we go again. <laughs> but this too shall pass, creatives. And that's kind of what I wanted to just talk about today because uh, I was reflecting on how strange it is actually being in Auckland, because it was almost exactly 21 years ago, I arrived in Auckland in December 2000. I was actually on my way back to the UK after spending nine months uh, backpacking around Australia. That year, I was in Sydney for the Olympics. And then I came to Auckland, I was going to do a couple of weeks in New Zealand and then head home. And I was actually going to join the foreign office. (laughs) I was going to start work out for peace in the Middle East. That was all my uh, my plan. What happened was I arrived in Auckland. I went north to go to the Poor Nights Islands where I was to go scuba diving. And uh, I, I went scuba diving, but I also <laughs> fell in love. I went home. Well, let's say probably fell in lust <laughs> that day. I went home with the skipper of the dive boat that night. And uh, that was it. I stayed in I stayed away for 11 years. I mean, I came back uh, to the UK, um, but I married the skipper. (laughs) Classic holiday romance that turned into a classic short-lived first marriage. And they're very, you know, very happy times. But obviously I was young. I was 25. (laughs) 
<laughs> holiday romances. Oh. So I was kind of reflecting on that. But what obviously once I got divorced, um, I stayed in Auckland. I, I loved my life here. I was a IT consultant. I still scuba dived a lot. I did a lot of windsurfing and uh, just had a really good time. It's a, it's a great city and New Zealand is an amazing country. Obviously did a lot of hiking and just did lots of things. And um, But I met Jonathan in 2005 and then we moved to Australia because he was he got a job over there. So it's weird being back because I feel like I'm a different person and we all are. Of course, if you think back to 21 years ago <laughs> to December 2000, like where were you? What were you doing that year? But I wanted to just bring this up as a question around our writing life and also around the pandemic because it is a challenging time and it's certainly been possibly one of the most challenging couple of weeks of my life the last couple of weeks seriously <laughs> the time has felt so slow when you are basically have to stay in a room and sometimes it feels things take forever and I know that it can feel like that for example you want to have more books you want to have a backlist we want to be making money as writers we want to have an email list we want to have a social media following we want to have done all of these things we want time to go past more quickly so that we can have achieved more and therefore hit our goals but then when you look back like I I look back at my I guess the, the my 25 year old self who arrived in Auckland and I go I can't believe the time has passed so quickly and almost we can't wish the time away because it does take time to learn how to be a better writer it l takes time to get better at the craft it takes time to get better at business to um you know think about the cumulative effect of things like email and social media and like this podcast it, things take time there's always more to write always more to achieve always another step to take so we have to enjoy the journey along the way instead of wishing the time gone so soon and when I lived here, it's so strange looking back, I was trying to change my life. I, I did a graduate dis diploma in psychology when I was here, but then I discovered the reality of what being a psychologist was. <laughs> and I decided I didn't want to do that. Of course, I, I put psychology in my books. Morgan Sierra from my Arcane series is a psychologist. Um, I also did some papers in creative writing when I lived here. So I was I was actively trying to change my life, but it was still another few years. It was like 2006 when I started writing, trying to do something uh, for publication. And of course, 2006 was too early to make money online as an author. We, we didn't have the tools we have now, but time passes, we change the cycle turns, there are new tools, new opportunities, we become better writers. And yeah, here we are again. So in many ways, I'm the same person I was in 2000. And in many ways, I am so completely different. And I'm seeing people who've been who were my friends. Um, and we're still friends. But of course, we're completely different people now. So yeah, I've put on my um, New Zealand green stone Punamu necklace, which is a infinity symbol, which is my is a is a New Zealand necklace, and I've taken off my shoes, <laughs> which a lot of Kiwis spend a lot of time in their shoes on, and I'm going to try and see the city with the eyes of the new me, rather than live in the past on the one hand, and or try and live in the future, try and say, oh, I wish it was post COVID, I wish it was. I wish we weren't in the pandemic. I mean, obviously, we all wish that, but we can't keep living in the past or the future. We have to think about now and celebrate how far I've come. I'm trying to focus on that, but also I hope that is how you can feel too. So my challenge for you today is can you look back and see how far you've come with your writing life in particular? Maybe it's only been a short amount of time or maybe it's been a long time <laughs> but think about how far you've come in the time you've had and have you written what you want to write or how can you take the next step towards that and can you celebrate where you are and not live in the past or in the future and this is a challenge for me certainly around travel I don't know whether travel will go back I don't it won't go back to how it was um, but what it will look like in the future is who knows <laughs>
But yes, trip down memory lane finished. (laughs) I hope that challenge helps you today to think about perspective and time. Time is weird right now, isn't it? Uh, In other things, Tomb of Relics came out in ebook, paperback, large print and hardback last week. And the audiobook is underway. Uh, But to be honest, I am really, really grateful for pre-orders because I was not engaged at all with the launch. It was very hard to care about anything. I I didn't really know what day it was, what time of day it was, because of course, with a 13 hour difference to the UK, the jet lag is brutal. (laughs) So um, pre-orders are amazing. And actually to reflect on pre-orders, we didn't have pre-orders for a long time as indie authors. So I am grateful for pre-orders to be able to get that all organized way in advance. So I had everything scheduled. And so I also wanted to encourage you, if you are not a fan of the launch process, you can use pre-orders you can schedule everything and you don't really have to be that engaged when things go live as such when things publish that day I, I haven't right now I haven't even looked at my sales I didn't look at ranking I didn't look at anything and it's now the fifth and it came out on the first so um I had email scheduled I had social media <laughs> scheduled I just let it do its thing so that is possible and I definitely don't take that for granted Uh, In other things, if you are craving some virtual escape, check out my interview with Cynthia Morris on my books and travel podcast this week as we talk about visiting Paris as an artist. And I certainly was like, oh, I wish I could be in Paris again, Uh, but only once restrictions are all over. So, yes, if you'd like some virtual travel, uh, check out Paris on books and travel podcast. I've also started working on my 2022 goals. And of course, I'll share those at the beginning of the year. I episode 600 is not far off on the podcast and I am going to make some changes next year. So I am going to do a podcast survey. I didn't quite get it organized for today, uh, but that will come next week. uh, And I'll probably I'll be emailing out as well. So a sort of survey on what you want, what would be useful to you and how I want to change things. So that is going to be coming up. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. S. Day Houston said, awesome interview with MK Williams. I think she's a great inspiration for others. And it was nice finding out more about how she approaches the business of being an author. And A.L. Wardell said, great interview, bridging the knowledge gap between FI, financial independence and the publishing publishing business is a win-win. Thanks for the podcast pitch tips added to my toolkit for the future. And finally, Blue Heron Creates said, thank you. I enjoyed the interview. Always helpful to have people who are on the same journey give lots of good advice. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation too. And it is always interesting to talk to people about their journey, especially as um, MK started, you know, a serious number of years after me. (laughs) Uh, But we still think similarly about many things. And uh, that's always uh, good to know. Thanks also to everyone who shared that this show was their Spotify wrapped podcast of the year. Thanks for listening, whatever app you use. So you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N and send me pictures of where you're listening. I would love that. Uh, Always good to see or email me joanna at the creative pen dot com or leave a comment on the blog comments or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Publisher Rocket by Kindlepreneur by Dave Chesson at Kindlepreneur, which is appropriate as choosing categories and keywords is also an important part of the metadata that people use to find your books, which is like all the things around the actual book itself. Plus, you can find a great formatting tool for your book description at kindlepreneur.com. So what is Publisher Rocket? So Publisher Rocket helps you with keyword and category searches on Amazon, which you need for your book metadata and your advertising, as well as generating lists of keywords for your Amazon ads. Plus, you can also use it for researching where a book might fit before you even write it. For example, I am, well, I'm currently writing these travel memoirs that I'm um, based on my solo walks, and I've been researching the travel genre subcategories and keywords to decide on a title and also some of the words to include in in my um, keywords and by book description. 
to appeal to the right kind of readers. So yes, you can manually spend time on Amazon doing it, but it takes a lot more time and you have to think of all the different permutations to search for. So Publisher Rocket saves you time and frustration in your research. It makes it easy, which let's face it is what we need so we can get back to writing. You can also analyse the competition. So, for example, I can type in solo travel or action adventure and Rocket will return a list of ebooks or print books that relate to the keyword phrase. I can look at their ranking, the price, the number of pages and drill down into categories, which helps me to add to my own list. So remember, you can list 10 categories per format of book on Amazon, but you need to find the 10 first. And Rocket helps you discover them when you're first publishing or if you want to change up categories over time as they are always changing. So I use Rocket to research um, my backlist as well. It also has a super useful Amazon advertising keyword search. So you can type in a keyword phrase and download lists of keywords for your ads. Publisher Rocket is one of my must use tools as part of my publishing process and it is very reasonably priced. So check it out at publisherrocket.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons and uh, thanks to new Patrons in the last few weeks, Scott Beeson, Carla Heiler, and Michael A. Herzog. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years and months and weeks. You guys are amazing. You can support the show with a few dollars or pounds or euros or whatever a month, and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio where I answer questions from patrons. It's about 45 minutes of extra Q&A. You get to ask whatever questions you like. And I'm pretty uh, open about the type of thing I answer. And uh, you also get money off my ebooks, audiobooks, and courses. You can support the show at patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Michael Brent Collings is an internationally best selling novelist and the only author to be a finalist for a Dragon Award, Bram Stoker Award, and Roan Award. A ranker survey recently named Michael Brent one of the top 100 greatest all time horror writers, but he also has written bestsellers in a dozen different genres. His latest book, Malignant, debuted on Amazon's bestseller lists all over the world. Michael Brent is also a screenwriter and helps authors with their book descriptions over on Fiverr Pro, which we'll be talking about today. So welcome back to the show, Michael Brent. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) It's great to have you back on the show. And you have been on the show a number of times. So we're not, yes, we're not going to go into your backstory. We're going to get straight (laughs) into the topic today, uh, which is all about book descriptions. And this is a very interesting topic. I mean, we both, you have a ton of books. I have quite a lot of books and I still feel this is an issue. So let's start with why is an effective book description so important and why are they so difficult? (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I think first of all, the reason they're they're super important, I mean, there's the obvious. It's one of the first things people see. So like your cover, as much as authors hate to admit it because we're like, my book should sell this book. Um, people are shallow, you know, like if I go onto an Amazon book page and it looks, the cover looks like it was done by like a five-year-old using Windows paint on a Commodore 64 or some god awful combination like that people are just going to be turned off because they know you're not operating at a level of professionality. You know, I kind of compare book purchases to dating, but it's almost worse because like with a date, you're committing to a couple of hours with a person and it goes badly and you never have to see or think of them again. With a book, you're committing to potentially a lifetime with that thing because I mean, if it's good, it's going to live in you forever. And if it's bad enough, you will always remember it. Like I can tell you exactly the one book I hurled across the room because I was so upset. And that happened when I was 16, you know, so these things stay with you. And, and so the cover is a big deal. And then the next big deal, assuming you've gotten them to your book page, because most people buy books electronically, we just have to face that Mm -hmm. is the book description. And the difference there is you're like, now I'm starting my job because most authors, the book cover is going to be outsourced, which is a wise thing to do. But for most authors, you get to that book description and it's like, here's me. 
I'm appearing for the first time. And so it's super important because like if you're reading a book description and it's terrible, well, you already know the author is not a wordsmith because they have failed to accomplish their primary objectives in this first couple paragraphs or even first couple sentences. Like I have a couple of book descriptions that are five or six sentences short. Um, and if you can't do that right, why am I going to let you into my brain for a hundred thousand words. Mm. And it, it just seems so unfair. I think it's unfair that we have to sell ourselves our book, not ourselves. Uh, we, we don't attach ourselves to the book, obviously. <laughs> it's but not to- that kind of book. <laughs> It's kind of like it's so unfair that we have to write a whole thing and then we have to come up with a pithy whatever book description that is the thing that represents us. And it feels so hard to me because I have written the book and it's all this massive thing in my head and it's full of cool characters and great plot and loads of great writing, obviously. And now I have Mm. to (laughs) boil it down. So... What what do people get wrong? You said they're a terrible book description. What is a terrible book description? I mean, you you pitched me with this idea because you said you'd seen a lot of them. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Like, honestly, most of them. Okay. So if you open Amazon up to a random author, you don't know. I mean, if it's Stephen King and you're buying Stephen King, you don't really even read the book description. You've already decided it. So I'm not talking about your favorite author. Go to some rando and read the description and you're just like, oh, well, this kind of sucks because most of them do. And and the problem is, well, first of all, most authors do hate the book descriptions because they're like you. They're like, this is unfair. I already did all this work and now I have to do another thing, you know, but that's life. And unlike this date analogy, like if I go on a date and we've all had that thing where and I don't any date anymore, except for my wife. I date her regularly. But you have this thing where you're putting on the perfect tie or the perfect dress and you spend 45 minutes. And I would always get there. But ultimately, in the back of my mind, I'm like, but I still look like me. So there's that chance gone. And <laughs> that's OK, though. You're ultimately on the date. It's you. And that's what the book description really is. Don't think of it as now I have to try on a million dresses. It's like and now I get to show them up front, you can have confidence in me. And you can do that. I mean, if you are a good enough author to write all of these words that make sense and keep all of the plots together, have a little confidence. You can do a good book description. But the biggest mistake that most authors make is exactly something you said. You're like, I have it full of all these cool characters and cool ideas. And you you have these fun, complicated plots and you want to put it all down. Yeah, I do. I really do. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, I spent so much time. People should know. But the only job of a cover description is to create a question. Take notes, people. Create a question that can only be answered by reading the book. And a great cover description creates a question that the reader has to have answered and can only get an answer by reading the book. So most authors want to put everything, and the reality is the best cover descriptions for a new author, for someone you're unfamiliar with, tells you very little. It will give you a sense of the genre. You want them to know that. And then it will give them a basic setup, and then it will leave them with some questions in their head. And you don't have to actually ask questions, although I do in a lot of my book descriptions. I find it effective. But you want them to go, wait, and then what happens? And and of course, they have to read it. Okay, so, and the thing is, I always completely agree with you, and then it's really hard to actually put into action. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to try and talk about the actual process of doing it, because, okay, the, okay we're going to take it from two angles. So the first angle is the person like me, who is a discovery writer, doesn't really know what they're writing. I mean, knows it's a thriller, for example, knows the genre, um, right. writes the book, and then has to come up with the book description, or someone mm-hmm. who already has has a book and they have a book description and they want to rewrite it or write it from scratch. So if we are someone who already has the book and has to now write this description, how do we go about it? Do we just write everything down we possibly can and then narrow it down or or how do we go about it if we have the book already? 
Okay. And that's a super good question. Um, I, I'm going to back it up even a step before that really quick and encourage people, you know, you can be a discovery writer and still have a great hook in mind. So like, I'm going to use one of my books that's really easy as strangers. And I didn't know where it was going to lead or how it was going to end or anything when I started writing it, but I knew the hook, which is a family wakes up in their own home discovers that all the doors have been jammed closed from the outside and all the windows are covered with sheet metal and there's a killer inside with them who wants some alone time. I still got to discover everything, but I started from a point where I was like, okay, that would make a cool movie poster. And that's where I encourage people to start with when they're beginning, think, is this a cool movie poster? Because movie posters encapsulate all of the basic elements of a good cover description for me. They have a central image that tells you like, oh, it's a slasher or, oh, this is a romance. So it gives you that kind of that sense. Here's what I'm getting into. And then it shows you enough cool imagery that you see a few money shots, you know, you know, Kylo Ren is going to fight with Ray because they're standing next to each other with their lightsabers crossed. So you can discovery, right? But that does not, it's not mutually exclusive from saying when you start, think to yourself, is there a hook here? Because audiences really like hooks. It, it, it excites them. One of the easiest sells in a movie was Underworld, which was a vampire movie 20 years ago. And I was working at Hollywood at the time. And it was like Romeo and Juliet with vampires and werewolves. And everyone went, oh, immediately, obviously, that's going to make a million dollars. And now there's been five movies in that series. So you want to hopefully start. And if you can't figure out that hook, maybe rethink your project, maybe think, okay, is there something else I could do? Because it's just the reality. If you want to mm. be selling books, you have to do things that sell books, you know? But, you well, but be... you've um, you've jumped uh -huh. into my alternate thing, which yeah, is coming yeah. up with the hook early. Coming up but, with it. Yeah, but that's, um, so let's stay on that then and we'll come okay. back to the other one. So, okay. and because I feel like you're completely right. I would love to come up with a hook before I write something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that answers the question of what to do with the book description. But the fact yeah. is that most of us can't come up with okay. uh, hooks beforehand. So what are some of your tips for coming up with those hooks? Okay, so first of all, don't fight it, okay? So many writers and artists in general, I feel like should, they feel like uh, my universe should be boundless. My universe should be without rules, but no, your universe functions within rules. And if you want to be an artiste and make things that are like aesthetically pleasing to your muse, that's cool. Um, and I'm not knocking that, but that's very different from, I want to be a published author and make enough money to put food on the table for me and my family. And in that case, you have to go in it from that mindset. And I don't mind that, you know, at first, I was like everybody else. Why should I have to do that? But now I really enjoy it. It's a process that I get a kick out of. So if you want to write something with a hook, basically, you want to be able to explain it in that sentence or two. I mean, I put like a 50 or 60 word limit on myself. And if I can't explain it to my nine year or, you know, seven year old and have him get kind of stoked about it. I'm going, this probably isn't great. And it's not because I'm saying that the average market has a seven-year-old mental capacity, but kids are great uh, litmus tests for cool. You know, like they see Disneyland and know it's cool. They see school and immediately like there, there is nothing here that I'm going to be excited about, you know, and there are quirks and irregular irregularities and exceptions. Disneyland has terrible lines. School has recess and lunchtime, they discover, but they are good. They can tell overall, I'm going to like this overall. I'm not. So I, I will pitch my kids. I'll say, here's some thoughts. And they're like, oh, that one's great. And that one's not. So find a disinterested person who's enthusiastic and say, I've got 50 words and look at them. And at the end, if they're not going like, yeah, and then go back to the drawing board. Uh, and that's hard because people come up with an idea and they're really excited. And that's the easiest part to write for every writer. It's like, I came up with the beginning and I'm 20 pages in because that's exciting and that's fun. And then the work starts and hear Michael Brent saying, only now throw away the fun part, you know, like, cause you're going to do work right at the beginning, but you have to do it. If you're going to write to your market, you're thinking, what do they like? And then you're thinking, how can I grab them quickly? So I try desperately not to go into a book unless I can have 60 words that explain the overarching concept, not the theme because themes are subtle and themes tease out over time and not all the characters and not all their interactions, but 
the basic idea. Strangers, a family is trapped in their own home with a serial killer. Boom. And everyone's like, okay, I know what that is. Um, so in that situation, the uh-huh. this hook needs to have some idea of the character. It doesn't need to be their name or whatever, but it need, we need to have a person or a, an alien or whatever the character yeah. is. And then we need to have a setting and then yep. we need to have a situation. Yep. And that's it, Joanna. Those are the things. And they should all three come together enough that you're like, that is going to be exciting. And the way you get there, people kind of will sit there and go, well, hooks and hook writing is really difficult. And it is and it isn't. I mean, you can go into any part of writing saying, well, this part's really difficult. Or you can go into it and say, but it's writing. And I love writing. So hooks are part of your writing. And that's part of standing out from the market. There are at least 10 million books on Amazon now. So you want to stand out. You want to have that hook immediately. And it's a process of asking questions. So you want to ask, what's my situation? What's my setting? What are the characters? And the way you can go about that is just say, start with one that's interesting. Um, So like I wrote a book called The Loon. And the process. Oh, I like for- that one. I read. Oh, that one. good. Okay. Um, so the process for that was really a matter of questions. I literally sat down and went, "What's a scary place? A uh, haunted house? No, I did one of those recently. Okay, what else? Uh, prison. Oh, those are scary. And then I went, "What is scarier? Uh, a prison full of crazy people. What's scarier than that? A uh, mental health institution with the lights out. <gasps> What's scarier than that? What if there's a monster in the basement that wants to eat everyone?" Okay, and now I have a really fun setting that grew into a situation. And my last question becomes, who would that hurt the most? The staff. Who in particular in the staff? Uh, The guy in charge, because he feels responsible. Why does he feel responsible? He he actually lost a child, like through his own self-perceived negligence, his own son was killed. And and that was literally what I did. It took about a day and a half and I was walking tight little circles in the middle of the living room. I'm not exaggerating. It was super inconvenient for my wife. She's like, yeah, get out of the way. I'm trying to watch TV and I'm just mumbling to myself. But it, it boiled down to those questions and it ends up in the loon, which is the pitch. A maximum security penitentiary for the criminally insane gets hit by a blizzard so severe all communications with the outside world is cut off. And the, the inmates are able to escape but cannot leave, which is a problem for the staff. But the bigger problem is the monster in the basement that wants to eat all of them. And at this point, I've told you, what have I told you about the main character? Nothing, really. Hmm. What have I told you about the monster? Nothing, really. What about the details of the layout of the loon, which is the facility itself, which is a cool facility? Like I could tell you all the research and stuff I did about that. It was super fun, but you don't know anything about it. I haven't told you the cool things. So that's the tough thing for writers moving into any writer trying to design their cover description. You have to be able to say, I'm not going to tell them all the cool things. If I did that, why would they read my book? You know, so that you get to the end of the pitch and the person reading who's reading the cover description of the loon, it's like, what kind of prison is that? Wait, what? A monster? Who's in the basement? Tell me more. And Mm. you've created those questions that must be answered. You know, these are serious questions. Um, A really good analogy for cover descriptions is we've all had that coworker who comes up to us and pulls out baby photos. And I love babies, but as important as babies are, your random baby has no place in my heart. So as soon as they pull out the pictures, you're like, oh, a baby with no relationship to me, no importance in my life, no real impact. I'm going to sit here and try and look interested because all babies that aren't mine kind of look alike. That's how most people tell their cover descriptions. They intrude into your life and tell you a long series of facts that don't matter to you. So if the same person walks up and grabs his wallet, and as he's opening, it says, so little Timmy's face caught fire yesterday. What? And now he can open or she can open their wallet and they're, and they're like, okay, we're going to start 
where he was as an egg cell. And it doesn't matter. You're totally in because you're like, I know there's value at the end of this story. There's a kid with his face on fire and that's terrible, but awesome. I mean, like, what's the story here? And that's your cover description. You don't want to walk up and tell them all your baby facts about your baby that they don't know and don't care about yet. You want to give them something huge that slams into them. Hey, Mm. Timmy's face caught on fire. So obviously this is genre specific and you're, <laughs> you write horror and uh, well, it has plot and character and setting. It has the same as everything else. But I, I, I also feel like with series descriptions, it's also slightly different because you're addressing new readers, but you're also addressing readers who already know who you ca- your characters are. Yeah. So yeah. you almost need to mention your character names or what they do because they want to know those characters back mm-hmm. and are, are kind of doing their thing. But yeah, um, yeah it, so can we go back to the sort of question? Of, I, see, I absolutely think your process is the best process, but the truth is a lot of us don't do that. We're already we do. there, yeah. Yeah, so we've already got the book. And so is the trick then to find the key place where yeah. things get excited and, and focus yes. on that but to me but also in a, a action adventure books like mine like a thriller that's what we're searching for and that might be mm-hmm. part of a mystery so how do we do it when we need to keep the coolest things hidden rather than emphasize them okay that's a great question and the answer is look at a movie trailer in the movie trailers they give you all the money shots i mean like you go to a movie and and you realize that the movie trailer showed the climax, but you don't know that in the movie trailer, you, because you're giving it without super amounts of context as to what's happening. And you can do that in a book description. So as far as like reintroducing uh, new readers and keeping old readers that your main character in a thriller or in any series, they should be somebody who's interesting and likable to everybody. Um, So like in the stranger book, which is actually a series, the bad guy in that evolves and is over time actually becoming a good guy who's hunting down bad guys. And his name is Legion. And so you can say for your old characters, Legion is back. Okay. Or for your old readers, Legion's back. And now they know, they know who Legion is. And for the new characters, you can say a psychopath on the hunt for other psychopaths with his two dead brothers calling the shots. Okay. My old readers know exactly what I'm talking about now. And the new readers should be going, wait, what the, what he's like a killer hunting killers. That's cool. And his two dead brothers are involved. So what's, and now you've noticed they've already got those questions. So you can update the new readers very quickly. And if your character was cool enough to pitch in that first book, You can pitch them again every book because you're going to do it so quickly and efficiently that your new readers are not going to have to, or your old readers aren't going to have to spend a page on it. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm stoked. Oh, it's still Legion. And then you get into the next question and you're going to be showing big moments. Again, bear in mind, if every one of your big moments can fit into a two or three or 10 paragraph description, you already are in trouble because you don't have enough cool moments for a 100,000 word book or even a 50,000 or 30,000 word novella. And cool moments don't have to be explosions or stabs or anything like that. Again, you think of the romantic uh, melodrama trailers and, you know, he's standing in the rain pleading, you know, like, I love you and you complete me. And there are all these moments that are enough to get the watcher invested and also go, that's so cool. That. <gasps> Oh, I'm in love again, you know, and but when you get to the movie, the movie isn't about those big moments. It becomes about how they are threaded together. And the same is with any book. So, of course, if you're writing about a romance, it's going to be a different attack on the book cover. You're not going to write quite spend quite so much time on the action necessarily as on the melodrama between the two. So like I write Western romances under a pen name, Angelica Hart and Grace Isabella is a, I'm messing the names up. I suck even with my own name. So uh, (laughs) Grace Isabella is a woman on the run haunted by her past and the only man she loved still after her. Um, And I'm making that up in the uh, kind of off the top of my head off of a very old memory, but um, you see there, 
okay, we've been told there's love in this. Grace Isabella is on the run from the only woman who or man she loves. And it's created, again, these questions. It's told a really cool thing, which is the guy that she married is still after her. And he's trying to make her life miserable. And he's doing all these awful things. And then you say, but Paul, a lonely ranch hand with secrets of his own. What secrets, says the reader at this point. Hmm. Um, and so you're creating these compelling questions within the framework of your book. So if you are done with your book, just look at it and go, what are the awesomest parts of my book? Well, there's a fight with ninja robots on top of the Eiffel Tower. That's cool. Uh, the earth blows up. That That's an interesting moment. Uh, oh, yeah. It turns out the main character is half a snake. And those are your three big, huge moments. Can you tell them in the book cover without revealing your story? Yeah. I mean, just right now, if I told you those three things, you know, nobody listening to that, I, I bet you, Joe, Joanna, aren't going, sorry, I got overly familiar, aren't going, oh, yeah, I see exactly how those three things tie together. I totally know this story. You're like, wait, what? There's robot uh, ninja fighting and there's a guy who's a snake and the earth. Wait, wait, back up. Tell me more. And that's where I'm like, ha ha, I refuse. Click buy now one click and that's your job and you haven't given away the awesomeness of your story because the genius of your story isn't the cool moments it's the fact that you the author have come up with so very many cool moments and then made them all make sense together hmm. and, and that and w- that can also apply to literary fiction or yeah. books that don't have massive plot details yes yes <laughs> just to be clear people <laughs> yes anything Whatever it is, there's a framework. And for your audience, they're going to go, this is the coolest moment. This is the second coolest moment. This is the third coolest moment. And you've got 20 cool moments. You can pull three out of them and mention them quickly. And you should still have enough left over that your audience is enraptured every page. I mean, really, do you want to be the author who is like, I am great at coming up with one idea and I spend a page on that, and the other 399 are just boring and crappy. No, of course not. You are an awesome author, especially like Joanna Penn. Folks, I'm serious. Like the Map Walker series, just so much fun. Like I tell people about it all the time. Um, and Thank you. oh, I, I, oh, so good. Well, just, but anyway, just, just, well, coming to that. So basically, yeah. what you're saying is if we've written the book already, we uh-huh. find, we get the coolest things in the book. Yeah. And those are the, instead of, having a more sort of introductory paragraph which is what a lot of people do including myself we put Mm -hmm. the coolest things on and then we also make sure we've put questions into the heads of the reader whether or not it's an actual question or not is fine but the reader should read it and have just a ton of questions that now need to be answered by by the by reading the book essentially yeah yeah. And so like pitching map walkers, I would say I would not talk about all the depth of characters. There's tons of characters. It's a cool fantasy, but I'd be like, okay, I'm talking to Ralph. I, I'm using that name because nobody's named Ralph anymore. Um, my grandpa was Ralph though. So it's still a cool name, but Ralph, have you read the map walkers? No. Okay. Oh my gosh, dude. What if you could draw maps and they came true? Okay. And, oh, and what if like the most powerful maps you drew like they were tattooed on you, Ralph, and in human blood, okay, like the more, and I'm not even telling accurately the story anymore, but I'm excited about it. And Ralph's going, wait, how does that work? It, because, and I've told him two big things mm. about your series, right? Mm. Um, does anybody going into your series on page one go, oh yeah, I know exactly what to expect? no but they've got this really cool framework. It's obviously fantasy because there's magic involved. Things come to pass kind of creatio ex nihilo in some ways, but they don't know all these details. They don't know what happens to maps that are forgotten. They don't know the details of all the dark shadow lands that the characters will enter and the forgotten places and things like there's so many things that you can get into with the map walker series. I just touched on two big ones. They still don't have a context. And so you're not giving away a secret. Now in a mystery book, obviously you're not going to want to start out with if the big, the whole point of the MacGuffin is finding out who did it, you know, you're not going to want to say the Butler did it. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> but Detective Max Stone doesn't know that yet. You know, like that's not how you go about it. You've actually just given a question away. Um, and so you don't want to answer that. You're yeah. going to say a body was found in a car in a locked room in a locked house that had been surrounded by concrete. Max Driver is on the case. And people are already like, oh, OK, I know what I'm getting into. And wait, what? First of all, how did that happen? And second of all, what kind of person would encase an entire home in concrete? Um, I've told some really bitching stuff that, you know, Max Driver is going to spend 200 pages even getting through the concrete. Like he's like, oh, we finally got to the house. Twist. The house is locked. What do we do? You know, and so Max is still having all these twists. And also you have to remember, here's one thing in a good book readers do. They read it and they get involved and they forget about the world. Here's one thing about the way people read books that no one ever does. Book open in the right hand, in the left, the cover description, me matching facts like, oh, okay, yeah, that happened. Uh, okay, good, good. I was waiting. Oh, I see. Like, if you're doing your job by page one, they've forgotten about the cover blurb and they're mm. just all in on your book. Even if you did tell them the butler did it by page 10, they're going, how though? How did the butler do it? This is an impossible situation. You know, no matter how much you've told them, they should still have more. You're only working with a page here. So have a little confidence in your own work. Mm. But the shorter you can get it, the more respectful you are of them as well, of their time. You're saying, you don't know me. I don't know you. Here's three sentences. Interested? And they'll either walk on happy or they'll buy your book. But if you yeah. capture them and hold them against their will, like I'm going to drag you through all of this, whether you want it or not, they're going to go away and say, not only eh, not interested, but oh, stay away from that Amazon page. It's the worst. Mm. So would you, I mean, you've obviously been writing for many years now. If you were to go back to one of your older books, do mm -hmm. you rewrite blurbs or oh yeah in, take but do you take one and tinker with it or or would you in or in my situation would you say start from a blank page don't don't tinker with the one you've already written Cut, uh -huh. start with a blank page and f start afresh because I I feel like many of us have tinkered with book descriptions in order to maybe put some more genre specific words in or we've just tinkered yeah. a little bit but is this a sort of fresh page approach might be better so I used to be an attorney. So I will give you an attorney answer, which is maybe, you know, like <laughs> you, you can do both things and try them both. And incidentally, you mentioned something about like genre specific wording. And we're talking now about Amazon's algorithm and things like that. And I would counsel you don't have that in mind at this point, because SEO search terms can always be added in. And if you've done your job describing it to market, they shouldn't be hard to add in. Um, you know, if you spend six pages talking about the love story on your cover description, and then you're like, oh, how do I work in the word serial killer? Well, first of all, you've already screwed up the description. You're not even describing it as a serial killer book, you know? Um, so I would say do both. There's some that I have looked at and at the time they were great. One of, I'll tell you one of my shortest blurbs I, or uh, cover descriptions I ever had was for a book called Run, and it did really well. It was the number one in thriller and uh, sci-fi and horror, a bunch of big categories. And the cover description was definitely part of it at the time because it was, um, gosh, I can almost do it probably by heart, even though it was 10 years ago. What do you do if everyone you know, family, friends, everyone is trying to kill you? Answer, you run. And I've created a lot of questions. I mean, I directly asked a question, but the, the questions that should spring to mind in the reader's head are like, wait, why would your friends and family and everyone want to kill you? It was a very effective cover description to the point that I got a phone call from a major Hollywood studio. And he's like, are the rights or the producer, are, are the rights for that available? And I said, yeah, they are. Um, so you're interested? He said, yeah, it's kick ass, man. You know, and I'm actually editing for content there. And he, uh, I said, Oh, what did you like about it? He goes, Oh, I've never read the book. I, I like mm. who has time for a 400 page book that the description was awesome. That's a total movie, you know, but over time it didn't work as well because the market shifts. And now the, the description is more detailed and it taught, it says basically the main character is a man who has never left his little tiny hometown, his entire life, except for once when he went overseas 
for war and saw a man graphically murdered. And 10 years later, that man shows up in the town and everyone the main character asks about it tries to kill him. And by the end of the day, the whole town's after him. So the new one is completely different. But if you look at it, I mean, the same core elements are still there. It's Mm. about everyone he asks is trying to kill him. And by the end of the day, he's on the run. And so I've still kept those money shots from the trailer. I've added information because audiences, A, like if you're going to one of my book pages, chances are now you've at least heard of me just because my name shows up in horror lists a lot, you know, if only subconsciously you're like, oh yeah, I think I've seen this guy. And so I can afford a little bit more time to show even more cool parts, but I'm not going to show them all of them. Yeah. It's just so for... on the sales page, mm-hmm. I'm looking at Ron now. So you oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So you as you said, now you are emphasizing something about yourself as a mm-hmm. as a multiple Bram Stoker Award finalist because you know that your or potential audience understand what that means in terms right. of the quality of the book. You've also included uh, review quotes, which I also noticed on Malignant, which is one of your current ones. And this yeah. is a question that a lot of writers have, which is there's this obsession in traditional publishing with asking other authors for blurbs or getting quotes to go on the cover. But how much is that important when, I mean, most authors are not <laughs> Bram Stoker nominees or multi-award winning writers like like yourself so should we just leave all that stuff off and not worry about that uh until potentially later and just go with the the book actual book description and how important are those other things okay that's an excellent question here's why i include them and i do that with all my books i include blurbs in the middle i think in movie terms and again you think of that trailer it's like the money shot (laughs) and the guy's walking away from the car as it explodes because he's so cool and and then it goes big words, quote, jaw dropping variety. And then the next money shot and you don't get taken out of it. You know, that's just social proof that they're injecting into the trailer itself. And you see this particularly on Oscar bait. It shows Tom Hanks and uh, uh, mini driver and, and Michael Keaton and all these big names standing, yelling at each other. I will tell the truth. Then you're fired. You know, fantastic says the hollywood reporter and it doesn't pull you out of the storyline because people can take that kind of multiple non-linear storytelling they're telling two stories one is the story of the book and one is the story of everyone's response to the book is amazing folks but if you don't have that you don't need it you don't have to do it it doesn't hurt it if you've done your job um so i will inject them if they're really good or if they're important in some way but they are primarily there for people who maybe have heard of me or seen one of my ads and they're clicking. They don't know anything about me, but they see, oh, a master Scream magazine. And they're like, oh, well, this guy, okay, somebody likes him. Um, if you don't have that, of course, don't put it. Or if your only review is literally like, I thought this book definitely had words in it. Mom and Pops podcast podcast number one from mom's basement. Like that's not going to be a super helpful one. Leave it out. But your cover blurb should still be super, super cool. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's important. And I don't really seek out quotes at this point, but I can see why they're (laughs) useful. It's something I might get into. But you did mention ads there. The hook or the the one or two sentences, are you using that part of the description in more places than the book sales page? So for example, in ads, in emails, in social media? Oh yeah, definitely. And that's why it's important to get it short too, because you think about the average ad, how much you care about it, you don't. Unless there's something incredibly compelling really, really fast. And you can complain about this if you want to. I find it kind of funny when authors complain about reality. You know, it's like, well, we're really glad no one has to write like Dickens anymore because Dickens writing is really hard. But I'm going to be upset because along with all of this freedom comes the reality that people expect some interesting stuff to happen right away. I mean, Dickens could lay out 472 character names and then be like, and now page 87, we begin 
the setting description and you're like, oh my gosh. Um, and we get to jump right into stuff where much more in medias rest. It starts out with uh, the bullet tore through her forearm, entering her radius, exiting her ulna and really screwing up her day. And that's so fun. We get to have a cool opening, but that also means we're training our readers to want stuff fast. So like a good example is I wrote a book called Terminal and it did really well. And the hook is, and I would do this on a Facebook ad, 10 strangers in a bus terminal are forced by a supernatural entity to choose one among them to survive. All the others will be murdered. The vote must be unanimous. And at this point, they should be like, what? And then I hit the kicker, which is, and they quickly realize the best way to get a unanimous vote is to kill everyone else. I've said two sentences. The opening was strangers in a bus terminal, which is kind of a evocative, you know, it might not be of interest to you, but a lot of people found it evocative. And I front loaded everything awesome about the setup there. Did I front load all the awesome details? No, I couldn't have. I had two sentences. So yeah, these descriptions show up everywhere. And again, if you can winnow them out and find that description, it's going to help your ads because instead of having to figure out some new compelling copy every time, you've already got all the elements. And it doesn't matter if it's Facebook, if it's Amazon, if it's a TikTok ad. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know the basic elements and you're going to be able to get them in a single sentence, two sentences, or a 10 second video ad. You know, you're going to be able to do that. And it makes marketing much more compelling and much easier because I can mm. port everything. You know, my Amazon description for terminal, ter Amazon ads are very short and it's like 10 strangers in a bus terminal forced to decide who lives. Mm -hmm. Let the killing begin, something like that. It's super fast and super easy because I've already created it at a base level very short. Yes, I think the, the overarching message here is to try and spend some time up front coming up with with a good hook. I, I, I think it's because I like spending time on research, for example, is mm -hmm. how to spend the time. And I also think the amount of time is exactly the point. It sounds like you spend, as you said, you spent like a day and a half walking around in circles, thinking yeah. about the hook. And I mean, even if it's after the book is written, it's the amount of time you spend on it. I have to admit to just doing my descriptions as a sort of they just have to be done mm -hmm. whereas I think what you're really saying is to spend time on that it might take a day and a half to write two lines but yeah. so be it <laughs> yeah okay and think of it this way like okay a day and a half who here said I say you're going to spend two solid days you're going to spend a week eight hours a day thinking of nothing but your description I'm going to make you do it come to your head and everybody goes oh forget it. Okay. <laughs> alternate situation. Um, you don't have to, but if you do at the end of the week, you get $30,000 and everybody does it now. And that's kind of the mindset that's more helpful to have because your book description is so important. Again, like I had one of the people who produced the matrix call me up based on a book description and it really impressed upon me the importance of this. And then also when I go to new pages, even with authors I do know, I look at that book description and I'm like, wow, this is a muddled mess. I am going to pass on this one. I'm too busy. Yeah, I think your analogy there of it's basically a spend the time and get the money. They're, they are actually buying the book description. Yeah. They, they don't know what's in the book. They're buying yeah. the cover plus the book description. And like you say, I think a lot of us outsource the cover and some people do outsource the book description. But when you do outsource it, you still have to tell people the gist of it because they won't read the book either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I think it's a very interesting challenge. But we are out of time. But I, I did actually have one more question for you, because last mm -hmm. year you came on the show and you talked about rebooting an author career. And yeah. we, uh, that was pretty much COVID had only really just started. And also traditional publishing had not really discovered 
digital. I mean, they'd started yeah. to, but I feel like in the last year, things have really changed in that traditional publishers have really muscled in on a lot of things that indie authors have been doing for years, for example, yeah. ads and all of those things. So what do you think has changed in the last year? And in terms of what you're doing now, has anything changed or are you finding things more challenging or yeah. So what does the reboot your author career look like this year? Oh, I'm rebooting it again. You know, it, and, and luckily it's not at the same place. I rebooted it last time, but I had to reboot then and I'm still rebooting because yeah, the biggest changes I've noticed with traditional muscling in is number one, ads are much more expensive. So it used to be, you know, the way Amazon works is there's kind of a bidding war that goes on behind the scenes digitally. Um, and instead of an auctioneer going, who oh, give me five, 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 four, you know, uh, it's just their computer going, zap, you got the high bid. And traditional publishing is doing a lot more of digital ads. And so it makes the bids higher. The biggest problem I found in the last year is actually not been issues with traditional publishers, but the privacy rules on platforms like Facebook and Twitter and even Google and things like that. They've really tightened up on privacy, which is a good thing for everybody except someone trying to sell an ad to a specific person. <laughs> so I'm going for somebody who reads Stephen King and Dean Koontz and Clive Barker and likes these seven things and lives in this area. And I used to be able to winnow it down really specifically and get inexpensive ads to the right people. And now it's a lot harder. So that's the biggest difference. And I continually reboot. So we're, you get more creative and it is difficult. I don't want to paint a picture like, oh, but no matter what, I'm smiling because one of my other podcasts with you is about depression. I have severe depressive disorder and a couple of other fun little mental things. And so this isn't easy, but it can also be kind of, I want to say joyous in a way, because you are coming up with new ideas that nobody else has ever thought of in your books. And now you get to do the same thing as a marketer, you're still engaging your creativity, which in a way is really fun. So what are new creative ideas I can come up with? So there's definitely a lot more, um, what can I do that's different thought versus what is everyone doing that works? Because if everyone's doing it and it works, it's probably too expensive for an indie. So once again, as authors, as artistic, creative, awesome freaking people, uh, it stands to us to go, all right, I'm going to do something different, something fun. I'm going to do, you know, a video. I'm going to do giveaways for this and that and the other thing. And and the fun part of it is it does engage your audience and and it makes it really delightful. I had a fan reach out and say, it was something like, you know what I like? I like that your books are good, but I love that I go to your Facebook page and everyone is nice and happy. And that was a really cool thing. I was like, oh, rad, screw being a writer. I made somebody's day good. Yeah, and I think it, what is important also, and I think you're very good at this, is nurturing your existing fans. And I feel like that that's something that a lot of people forget. I mean, the fact is you don't need to do Amazon ads necessarily to the people who already are on your email list because you can email them or people will get that pushed into their um, their recommendation list, for example. And with your emails, you do talk quite openly about some of your challenges and also the books and also the giveaways. So I feel mm -hmm. like that nurturing of your existing fan base actually generates more word of mouth it generates podcast opportunities it generates yeah. um the them to buy your next book and it, perhaps that's what we're coming back to perhaps we're coming back to word of mouth and nurturing our existing fan base and the basics that have always worked email marketing <laughs> all have yeah. always worked yeah and i and here's an important thing too that i really encourage especially I, since i had that reboot and you know you reached out and and I like to think part of why you reached out to me and a couple other people did um I like to think part of it's cuz like you were going you're a good author you should still write but I know part of it too is we're just friends and you're a nice person and when you're friends with nice people and they view you as a nice person you you help each other through the tough times you know and that's something that I do encourage as far as marketing you cannot say to yourself I'm going to be the most successful person in my field. There's, you can't, you'll be lying because there's always someone who's more successful on some level. And there's just too many variables. I mean, it's impossible to predict that or to demand it of yourself, but you can say, 
I am going to strive every day to be the nicest and most professional acting person in my field. And that reaps benefits, not just with your peers, but with your fans. And I think that's super important. So if people want to try your books or check out what, everything you do <laughs> online, where can people find you and everything you do? Oh, well, you can, first of all, just enter my first name in Google. Michael Brent is actually my first name. I'm the only Michael Brent in the world. You can go to my website, writteninsomnia.com, written insomnia, stories that keep you up all night, or novelthrills.com. And if you go there, you can get one of my books for free. You know, sign up on my newsletter. I try and keep my newsletters entertaining. There's commercials in them, but I try and make them not the main thing because I'm a writer, so I should entertain you. And if you want help on this particular subject, I'm actually what's called a Fiverr Pro. So if you go to fiverr.com, which is like an outsourcing thing, they have certain people that they actually reach out to and say, you're a professional in this field. Would, Would you be interested in working through us? So if you want help with your cover description, you can find me on fiverr.com and, and reach out to me there and I can give you some assistance. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time as ever, Michael Brent. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. You are awesome. So I hope you found the interview with Michael Brent interesting. And one thing that particularly stuck with me is that people buy the book based on the cover and the book description. So it's worth spending the time if you want to make money back. So uh, if the book description is worth $30,000 or even $1,000, wouldn't you spend some time on it? (laughs) Now, it is hard to hear as a discovery writer, but the writing craft is a journey we're on for a lifetime. So I'm always open to learning new skills. So I promised you the rewritten book description. So here we go. Here's my original one for Tomb of Relics. Ex morte vita. From death comes life. When a relic of St Thomas Becket is stolen from Canterbury Cathedral, England, arcane agents Morgan Sierra and Jake Timber are called in to find it. As the trail of missing relics leads them across sacred sites in Europe, Morgan and Jake discover something far more sinister lies beneath. So that was my version, and here's Michael Brent's rewritten version. A supernatural relic, a thousand-year-old conspiracy, a madman who turns death into art. It's all in a day's work for the agents of Arcane. When a priceless relic disappears from Canterbury Cathedral, Arcane, the agency tasked with protecting the world from supernatural adversaries, fears the worst and sends its best. Now Arcane agents Morgan Sierra and Jake Timber are on the job. Across Europe, through historical cities and into spectral forests forgotten by time, Morgan and Jake will follow the bloody trail of hidden relics wherever it leads, whatever the cost. But even they aren't ready for what's coming. Their hunt will lead them beyond danger, beyond darkness, to the shadowed heart of a hidden citadel where lives an evil unlike any they've ever seen, and to a dark choice that will change them both forever. New York Times and USA Today bestselling author J.F. Penn invites you to brave her most thrilling adventure yet. A world of the strange, a world of the supernatural, a world of the arcane. Da, da, da. <laughs> I think you'll agree it's a lot better. It definitely reads more like a movie uh, script, which is or a movie trailer, which is what Michael Brent talked about in the interview. So I'm really happy with it. And that is now the description that I use on Tomb of Relics. Well, it's on the um, ebook and it's on the online versions, but on the back of the print book, it's still the old one. <laughs> OK, so there you go. And you can check out Michael Brent's um, Fiverr at fiverr.com forward slash MB Collings. I think that's the, that's right. Anyway, I've put the links in the show notes so you can check that out. Okay, so next week I have an interview with the fantastic Lisa Cron about her new book, Story or Die. And Lisa's been on the show before talking about her other books. Um, and I know how many of you love Lisa's books and courses. So that is coming up next week. We are still on Craftastic. <laughs> so happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. 
You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.